Welcome back for our last afternoon at Campus Party. We will have four hours full of probably very awesome content. <laughs> I hope so. Um, our next presentation um, is called The Listening Machine. And The Listening Machine is actually a six month long piece of generative music um, created through the 500 UK Twitter accounts of UK, uh, from the UK, right? That's correct. It's a completely digital native piece of music. Um, the we will have um, two presenters, which are Peter Gregson and Daniel Jones. They are the heads behind the listening machine. Peter Gregson himself is a cellist and composer, but also collaborates with leading technologists like the MIT Media Labs. He will introduce the artistic concept of the listening machine. And Daniel Jones is a PhD researcher of the, at the Goldsmith University of London, and he will give us a brief overview of the developer aspects of the listening machine. Thank you. Hi, and um, thank you Jana and everyone at Campus Party for this amazing event. Um, so my name's Daniel Jones. Um, as Jana said, I'm a sound artist and coder based in London in the UK. And we're going to be telling the story um, of the development of this piece of music, kind of from start to finish. So how, how we conceived it up until realizing the piece as a web-based piece of generative music that uses classical orchestration to create a piece of music that is generated from the real-time interactions of several hundred UK Twitter users. So turning their speech and their sentiments and their thoughts and feelings into a piece of music um, that can be heard by the public. Now, can everyone hear me before we proceed? Okay, great. So, um, very briefly, this is what the piece looks like to the public. So this is the website um, of the listening machine and the primary way in which the piece is accessed and listened to. Um, the whole concept is that at any point you can tune into this and listen to the piece as it is generated live. Um, we'll start with the background to that. And so Peter Gregson here, um, who is a very talented cellist and composer, will start from the start, talk about how he first conceived the piece, how we developed it together, and finally got to this point. Hello. Uh, so as Dan said and Jan has said, I'm Peter Gregson. I'm a cellist and a composer. And um, a lot of my work involves working with technologists and technology companies. And I was in San Francisco maybe a year and a half ago and was having some margaritas with a friend of mine who was at the time the chief scientist at Twitter, a guy called Abdur Chowdhury. And while we were talking, it occurred to me that he was describing big, sort of unimaginably large data sets with the same words that we use to describe music. And he was talking about the orchestration of data, he was talking about the width and the spread, the volume, he was talking about uh, users in little groups, like we define members of an orchestra or members of an ensemble. And I got really excited by this and thought, wouldn't this be brilliant to make a piece of music from that? And to hear to hear what that sounds like. Uh, data visualization uh, is very, very fashionable in British media at the moment. You can open up any newspaper and find graphs of kittens and you know, kittens who own shotguns, all these sort of things. Um, but it creates a snapshot in time. It doesn't have a sense of flow and it doesn't have um, a kind of human element to it, which music does. And we, I was thinking, well, piece of music, we can create a really fluid sense of what data does and how it interacts and how it moves around the world uh, 24 hours a day. So then thinking, well, any piece that we would create couldn't just be about individual bits of information, individual pieces of data. It had to reflect human phrasing. It had to reflect uh, dynamics of conversation and emotion in the same way that Twitter conversations. Is that feedback coming from me? OK. Uh, in the way that Twitter conversations aren't isolated events, they they have a context and they have a meaning in that context. If you isolate them, they have less meaning. And being, as I have been introduced, as a cellist, uh, it had to be for real instruments because samples sound crap. So it was going to have to be for real things, real instruments. And that, again, represented a, a problem. 
And so guided largely through my sort of naive optimism, uh, I was working with Dan on, a, on another project and I don't really have a, a sort of base level technical grounding. And so I went to him with this, this idea of, oh, we'll just turn Twitter into a piece of music. And his eyes <laughs> sank. <laughs> um, and had no idea how much we were going to have to unpick and, and understand in order to create this, this piece of music. Uh, Dan's a, a perfect collaborator for this. He's got a, a huge background in, as he said, sonic arts, um, and really brought a kind of innate musicality and, and technical genius to the whole thing to, to realize the piece. So um, just before realizing uh, this piece, I'd actually been um, really interested in digital sociology and thinking about the structure of a social network. And more or less, it looks something like this. So we have a whole load of nodes, which are people on a social network, and they are interacting with each other. And these interactions develop and change over time. So it looks like this, a kind of graph or a network of, uh, of individuals. Um, and so we started talking in terms of this, in terms of how do you translate this graph into a piece of music. You've got um, potentially tens or hundreds of millions of people interacting every day. Um, it's a very, very difficult logistical problem to translate this huge graph of interactions into something which is meaningful. So we started thinking about ways in which you could take a small subset of that, um, kind of a sociological sample, which is still meaningful, but tells a bit more of a story. So there was this incredibly interesting kind of breakthrough movement in the early 20th century in England called the Mass Observation Project. And the idea of this project was it was a government-led initiative um, by a team of sociologists who asked a few hundred anonymous people around the UK to keep diaries of their everyday lives. Um, basically to record the banalities of what they have for breakfast, what they dreamt about, um, and even to the point where they, they were eavesdropping on their neighbours. So they would be asked to write down what their friends were having for breakfast, what, um, what their relationship statuses were, etc, 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 etc. And so we were thinking this would be a really nice way to go about this project because there's a pretty big link between this kind of small scale sociology and the kind of um, networks that we see on Twitter. So. This is um, an excerpt from 1937 from the Mass Observation Project. 6.30 a.m. Rose and got my husband's breakfast. He was going to the coronation. 7.30 a.m. Went back to bed and dreamt that I saw a dagger under the king's pillow and a note on the pillow. Then I dreamt that I saw a yellow race car coming along the coronation route, which overturned in the roadway. So then 75 years on, we moved to Twitter. And we have this quote from Tori and Sarah, aka Peace Love ST. I had a dream last night. I completely forgot about prom. And it was six, and I was still in my pajamas. Lol, lol. Then I got hit by a bus and woke up. So you see, nothing much has changed in a lot of ways. And we decided um, to take this kind of micro portrait approach and look at just a relatively small group of people and what they were saying and how you can understand the whole community from a very small subset of it. Um, and most importantly, do so anonymously. So we selected a whole load of different people, um, of which this wasn't one, and started looking at what this few hundred people were saying, and um, started thinking, what is it that people say, and how can we extract meaning from that? And then how can we turn that meaning into something which has musical meaning? So something that has a cadence, um, and something that has rhythm, and something that we can kind of relate to emotionally. So we have another example to eat here from Jamie Fox One. Love it. Would be awesome to watch a robot try to ski. Robots compete in their own Olympics. HTTP, blah, 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 BBC. So what we've got here is a small piece of text with which we can start to apply computational techniques to understand it. Um, a technique called natural language processing. So using a program, we can um, analyze each of these words and try to extract what they are saying semantically. So firstly, love it. Now this is clearly a positive sentiment and so we know um, that emotionally this is a kind of, the, this is, this is a, a positive tweet in a way. Um, awesome, likewise. And the more of these positive words, the more um, positive we can infer that the, that the sentiment um, behind it is. And likewise, we can then look at the nouns and subject matter of this to extrapolate um, topical meaning. So they're talking about robots, they're talking about skiing. This is clearly related to sports and technology. Um, and finally, we have this other piece of kind of technical meaning, which is a URL at the end. 
So we broke this all down and thought, how can we map these different things, sentiment and topic and uh, technical items, into musical elements? And we ended up with this flowchart, which you probably won't be able to read uh, from the back. But what we, hear, what we have here is um, coming in a feed of tweets, then analysis um, based on the classification of the tweets, i.e. what are they talking about, um, the sentiment of the tweets, are they positive or negative, and the prosody or the rhythm of speech that the tweet uh, exhibits. And so we then started writing a whole bunch of compositional processes that would turn these things into musical elements. At the same time, we were starting to think about the visual aesthetic of the piece. So we'll start introducing this with each of these diagrams. So this big cog, um, you know, listening machine cog kind of works, um, represents the current rate um, at which people are tweeting at. So if we look at the speed or the density of tweets, we can map this to the BPM, as it were, of the piece of music. So um, at 4 a.m., very few people are on Twitter and talking, and the piece should be very sparse. At 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and uh, lunchtime, clearly this rate dial is going to switch right up, and we'll have a lot of musical events going on at any one time. Quite simple. Um, secondarily, we have the sentiment mapping. So this is a triangle of sentiment. Is a tweet positive? Is it negative or is it neutral? Is it just a matter of fact statement? So musically, what makes sense here is to map this onto the mode of the piece, i.e. the kind of harmonic structure. So if the majority of the tweets at any one time through this subset of the population are positive, then maybe we'll switch to a major key or play some more um, jaunty sounding refrains. And um, likewise, if we go into a more neutral frame of mind, uh, then the piece can become more kind of modal and abstract. And the final part of the kind of large-scale classification is, is, is that in itself a kind of topic-based understanding of what people are talking about. Now, um, a bit of background to this piece was that it was commissioned by a, um, a project funded partly by the BBC, um, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, who also, as, as you will probably know, have a very influential news website, uh, BBC News. Um, this is broken down into a whole load of different uh, topic categories, which we used to categorize each of the tweets that people, uh, um, uh, the tweets that are produced within this sample, so that we can say, okay, this tweet seems to be about sport, this tweet seems to be about technology. Um, and this will raise the likelihood that we'll play kind of tiny little modular themes related to these things. So we have a, sp a sports theme, we have a technology theme, and each of these are then broken down into a whole load of interlocking parts which can be recombined and regenerated and translated, most importantly, into all of these modes. So, you know, it's the Olympics, Jessica Ennis has taken gold. More than likely, what we're going to hear is this piece generating a whole load of music which is in a major key and incorporating these kind of sporting themes in some way. Clear-ish? OK, cool. Um, so the logical um, progression then is to use these same set of classifications, arts, politics, health, business, sports, science, technology, and education to actually develop our sample of users. So what we did was sample um, roughly 10% of the people that are being observed for this piece are taken from these fields. So, for example, 10% of the Twitter users are potentially large arts organizations or artists or other arts funding bodies. 10% are taken from sport, 10% are MPs and other parliamentary figures. Um, and we did this through a bunch, again, of algorithmic processes to sample from Twitter lists to develop this. Um, anonymous sample and it really was important to us that these people didn't know that they're being followed so up to this day not a single person whose tweets are being turned into music actually knows about this because obviously the problem is the moment they know they're going to game the system and start going la 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 uh, and turn the listening machine to mush so um, we're thinking that at the end of the project we'll reveal to all of these people who they are and you know thank them for essentially uh, composing this piece of music that we've taken all the credit for. Um, the one thing that we've missed so far is what is the actual music? So we know it's in a major or minor key, we know it might play a, a sporting theme, but note by note, how do we generate the individual patterns? And this was the final piece of the puzzle and actually the part that took the most thinking and the most work and the most recording. Um, 
And the way in which we decided to do this was going back to the text of these tweets um, and actually taking um, the rhythm of the words within each tweet and then translating those into musical patterns. It's quite a simple um, concept, but one that was surprisingly effective. So here again we have this tweet. Love it. Would be awesome to watch a robot try to ski. Robots compete in own Olympics. And what we can then do is translate that into a musical phrase. Durden. It might go. Um, hopefully, somewhat more tuneful. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so we did this by looking at the text, dropping anything that's not a vowel. So we're just looking. So here we've got a it, o e o um, o o o o o i o e. So we look at each of these vowels, use a, a pronunciation processor in a language called Python to extract these vowels, and then also take the rhythm of the speech, um, which will generate the rhythm of the notes. So here we have a sentence, the pronunciation of a typical sentence expressed as music, and turn each of these vowels into a musical note by mapping them on a scale based on whatever mode we're currently in. So if we're in an F major, it will map each of these vowel sounds to a corresponding note in the F major scale. And so hopefully you should now be able to hear this. The pronunciation of a typical sentence expressed as music. Get it? So. That was kind of step one. And what we just did there is play that through a set of MIDI samples. So we, we had a bunch of pre-recorded notes of various instruments. Um, but the ambitions for this project went way beyond just using samples. Um, Pete will talk more about this in a second, but um, the key ambition was to actually record this with real professional world-class musicians. So we partnered with a chamber ensemble called the Britain Symphonia and went about this process of turning these musical patterns into a real score on real paper that a real musician could play so that we could record each of these small refrains, words really, and then turn them into music. So what we have here is an, al an, <clears throat> an analysis of um, the most common 1,000 words in the English language and how they are pronounced. So ever and better and never would all be mapped onto the same sound because they all have a kind of e uh phrasing. So that might be da da. Um, so we then went away and wrote, or generated rather, a whole load of scores which then incorporate each of these words for a musician to play back so that we could record and um, break them up into the individual word sounds. Um, and this is a, a quick chart which shows you another way in which you can map these vowels onto notes by using the formant frequencies of the voice, which um, I won't explain too much about here. So this is what we ended up with, a whole stack of um, several hundred page scores of the most monotonous music you could possibly imagine. The same boring sentences repeated again and again and again in various different modes and different tempos, um, which we put um, a handful of these incredible musicians through very, very traumatic days in the studio to record. Um, and here they are being traumatized. And, um, Peter will now tell you a little bit more about the musical processes that we then went through. So, that's, uh, that's quite a, an exhaustive thing. We, we had six weeks to pull this whole project together. So this was all racked in between the hours of about one in the morning and six in the morning. This was a very, very intense project. Um, I think before I talk too much more about the music, it's very important to Sort of agree that language and music are both about phrasing and communication. Uh, they're not, it's not about isolated bits of an alphabet and it's not about isolated notes. It's about the longer, I'm going to use it, it's about longer form phrases and sentence structures. You know, you look at a book, it's not made up of just discrete measures of the internet. Um, it's made up of sentences, and they make up a story, and they make up phrases, and they make up a book. There's always a larger structure to look at. And with traditional data sonification, it might just take one reaction to a discrete action. So 
the word the might have a sound. We want to break it down into lots of tactiles of interesting bits, making, using a million straight lines to make a circle sort of thing. And the thing that really excites me about this piece and this project, it was working with Daniel, it was writing the code that, that generates the piece. Uh, it's a code with a compositional aesthetic. So we spent a lot of time talking about how this piece will look, what it will sound like, what it could do, um, rather than just writing from the beginning of the piece to the end of the piece. And say it runs for six months, and writing six months of music is quite a lot, and it would take six months to record. So I didn't write six months of music. We wrote six months of potential music. So we wrote uh, music pulled for vowels, topic, uh, keyword themes. So we've got a, a business theme, a politics theme, sports, entertainment, art, ent all the eight categories. And then various keywords as well, things like lol, or um, if you post a SoundCloud link, or a Bitly link, if you post an Instagram thing, or a YouTube link, they all have different tonal rules. They all have different phrases and different structures. Um, there's, that, there's some human voice in there, give it a real human element for the consonants, um, which are both voiced, so pitched, and unvoiced, unpitched. We've got field recordings, so if someone talks about sitting in a pub, it'll play a, a sample of the Harp pub in Covent Garden, as it happens. Uh, and then a whole series of really bizarre orchestration machines, which I got really obsessed with, because uh, it was largely the only thing I had to become obsessed with. Um, but we've got one which, which I remember when Dan first sent to me, and it's, it's, they've all got stupid names as well. So the first one's called the Reichemat. It creates this kind of Steve Reich-esque uh, percussive, insistent rhythm. Uh, we've got the Lally phone, which is a, a girl called Lally singing and singing different combinations of notes, different phrases, different, um, different shapes of vocal line. And we've got the, the, the Glycitron, which is joining between notes in interesting and sort of evocative ways. And the one that that's really adds texture and depth to the piece is called the Hupeggiator. So anyone who listens to electronic music or electronica will, be, will have heard a thing called an arpeggiator, which is where a keyboardist plays five notes and holds them down, and the computer makes it sound like you're playing an awful lot of things very, very quickly. And it'll go... It'll regenerate instantly, and it sounds brilliant. We, I really like that sound, and I think Dan probably did before. If he didn't before, he does now and really sold on this concept of we needed to find ways to instantly add density or instantly thin it out and we didn't have too much time to record people doing every option. So it came, came up with this thing called the Hupeggiator which was to get the orchestra of, of musicians to play um, predetermined chords, so notes that we had set, set into the major, minor and modal tonalities for each different uh, environment and record the permutations of those notes in their own way. So get them all in a big room, isolate the studio, so everyone's sitting in the same room at the same time, recording, and get them to play the two notes in front of them in, with any rhythmic stress they wanted. So I over here might go da 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 for, it was a really embarrassing length of time, it was like three hours or something that session, it was horrible. Um, and over here, you might have someone going da 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 and over here, you might have someone going You put them all together, and you get one chord. It's a unified chord, but it sounds huge, because they're, they're all playing in time, but they're all playing them in different orders. And the really exciting thing with that is it means we can recombine those. So any two notes, they don't just have one function. They can be used in all sorts of different permutations. And it, it really makes it sound very expensive very quickly. And that's normally how you would look at writing a piece of music. You look at orchestration techniques, how to get the most out of a piece of music. And with this, you can't control those things in advance. We don't know what people are going to say. So writing for that comes into this, this world of potential music again. It's, it's uh, all in. Uh, we, we called up the file count just before this. All in, it gives 43,966 discrete musical elements, which I really now want to go and count through an opera, but I mean, that, that just feels like quite a lot. It feels like quite a lot of stuff. Um, 
actually, well, just before I move on, the, the topic themes and the keyword themes are also modular. They, they are longer pieces. They're 12, 15 bars long. They're a minute or two minutes long, some of them. But they all work on top of each other. And all individual strands can be separated out and played with any other strand at any other time. So the, all the music, although it's very melodic and tonal and actually sounds quite nice, it can, it can be played with itself in any, any sorts of ways. So it can constantly keep evolving. And although this piece isn't in sonata form, in a traditional classical model, and I don't think it should be, uh, it does have its own way of musically representing human conversations, uh, conversations, heart, thoughts and feelings. And it's got this very distinct aesthetic uh, and its own identifiable sound world, which I think is, is the key thing. Uh, we had all sorts of interesting problems with, with recording this. It was tedious. Um, I think each day we had to get through 6,000 bars of music and it was not enjoyable. <laughs> and uh, it's so simple that when you record it, actually you start making mistakes. So people were playing really simple music, but it was so boring <laughs> that they actually started getting it wrong. And so we had to find interesting ways of getting them excited and getting them playing with sort of fun extended techniques, and, which ultimately ends up making it sound far more exciting because you get these real human sounds. So hopefully, between, between our both our kind of little how this piece works, uh, it's really, it's quite complicated under the hood. But at the front end, it's, it's very human. It's, as Dan said, it's kind of gnarly in the morning. It's, it's quite busy at lunchtime. And it really, it chills out through the night. It's really ambient and relaxing. Uh, it's sort of the opposite of what radio stations do. And it, we, I like to think of it as a sort of human, human playlist. So it creates this lovely kind of ambient piece of music through the night. So it's back to Dan. So I wonder if at this point we should actually listen to the piece um, as it is. We've talked a lot about the music and you heard a very cut down version. Um, but because it's uh, a web-based piece of music, of course, we can um, have a listen to this live with luck. Um, so this is the website, thelisteningmachine.org. Um, this is a cross-platform thing, so you should be able to listen to this just as easily on an iPad or iPhone or uh, a desktop. Um, and up here we have a play button which um, will give us a live stream of the piece using the tweets which are being spoken over the previous minute or two minutes. So let's see if it works. So um, this is the listening machine. Um, over on the right here, we have uh, a whole bunch of dials which indicate the status of the piece. So this is um, an HTML5 uh, interface which uh, you can look at at any point to see what it's doing and how it is generating the music that it is. And so here we have this sentiment dial. So clearly people are in a slightly more negative frame of mind at the moment. This is the rate, which is currently quite low, um, but should pick up again towards the end of the working day as everyone gets back on the old uh, tweets. Um, and in the bottom right, we have the subject category. So it's looking like at the moment, science is the most prominent um, in what people are discussing. Or it could be that it's the scientific sector of our population, which is being most active. Um, and a lot of the time, it's quite hard to link these to anything that you might be aware of. But um, certainly during big sporting events, sport shoots up, um, 
after the Rebecca Wade scandal, uh, the politics style shot right up, and so you start to hear the politics theme coming in again. And as Peter mentioned, the really nice thing is this kind of day and night cycle. So listen up 4 a.m., and you'll hear a note every maybe 15, 20 seconds, and it becomes incredibly sparse, which um, we really wanted to retain because it's an accurate portrayal, hopefully, of what this small group of people are doing. So um, for the... Um, like to start private browsing. So for the more technically inclined, uh, this is um, a slightly more detailed flowchart of how the piece um, is constructed. Um, so very briefly, the whole infrastructure is coordinated in a language called Python um, with, a, with, a, with a toolkit called NLTK to do the natural language processing. Um, and at the end of the day, what that is doing is triggering a whole load of samples and frameworks in an environment called uh, Max for Live, which is an Ableton Live uh, extension linked with Max MSP. And um, really, it's the linkage between the two that allowed us to make this piece. So the flexibility of Python um, for the moment-to-moment -moment analysis and the power of Live to do the kind of pro-level production and... Um, mastering techniques that were really important to make this piece sound as if it were classically orchestrated, I think. Um, and finally, putting the whole thing in front of the public is done using this framework of HTML5 and jQuery and a few other JavaScript-based frameworks, uh, which are then put out via the website and a BBC content delivery network, um, which is where the stream itself comes from. So that's the kind of technical um, makeup of the piece in a nutshell, I guess. So um, that's the piece, really. Uh, I think now's the time to kind of reflect a little bit on, on why we were doing this and what its, what its meaning is to us and what it kind of tells us about composition and about the world of digital. So um, Pete will talk a bit more about that. And actually, the other thing I forgot to, to mention during uh, my last little tirade was you're talking about mixes and, and you know, it's a piece of music. The way you mix a piece of music before you release it is you finish recording and you finish the piece and then you make sure it sounds good. It's very hard to do that when the piece doesn't exist. So we had this really fundamental problem, which is how do we guarantee it's going to sound at least acceptable? Um, in, in the time leading up to it going live, we were really into this, it's just got to work, it's just got to work. <laughs> and how do you make it sound good? So we, we ended up deciding that the way we were going to do that was instead of having a kind of overarching sound and a, you know, like a Pink Floyd album has a kind of consistent reverb, we went in and made the violin, we isolated the violin and made the violin just sound like the best bloody violin we could make it sound like. We made the cello sound great. We made the oboe sound great. We made everything just sound really nice. Um, and actually it worked. It's a really simplistic way of thinking about mixing. I've never thought about it before, and I've, never, I've not changed it since. It's really easy. We just made every inst individual instrument sound fine, and uh, then set the volumes roughly to a little bit quieter than loud, and, and press play. So yeah, why? Um, in my line of work, I often get asked why I do technology projects, and say as a classical cellist, the cultural overheads of a cello are quite strong and anything with a, a digital prefix or a 2.0 suffix, you always get asked why. But you don't get asked why Wordsworth wrote poems about the clouds or why Benjamin Britten wrote symphonies about the sea. So the kind of the need for defense is kind of a bit jarring. We were partnering with a very establishment classical organization, regularly funded by the British government. Um, We've been very clear from the outset that this is not to be used as a bait and switch to get people into the concert hall. This is a thing that exists in and of itself. It's not saying, you like this, now come to this. This is, this is the piece in and of itself. It's site-specific in the same way that an opera is site-specific. They are written and installed in places. They aren't mobile, although this obviously actually does work on a mobile phone. All I mean is it's, it's in a specific place. It was written... This was written to be digitally native. It was written to live on the internet. It wasn't written to live in a concert hall, and we didn't treat it like it ever would be. And the thing that really interested me, uh, the, the platform that commissioned this is called The Space. And the thing with the listening machine is it isn't a piece of archived work. It doesn't work on YouTube. It doesn't work 
as a flattened thing. It's live. If you watch a piece of theatre on the internet, I, I would contest you're watching a film, you're not watching a play. If you're looking at a, an art gallery, you're not looking at a watercolour, you're looking at a photograph. Whereas this is a live piece of music. And real people playing, there's, there's some nice, nice things. Um, it's also not permanent. We are turning it off on the 31st of October. And haven't quite worked out if it's going to have a perfect cadence or it's going to have jazz hands, what it's going to do. Um, but it does finish. And there's something that I really like about that. I think it, as a kind of digital generation, we've lost the, the kind of the frailty of a painting that it can be destroyed. See, you know, sound quality doesn't get worse. Like this idea of digital impermanence is something I'm really excited by. And um, I was speaking to someone recently about this piece and they couldn't understand why you would turn something off. It's like, well, it makes it all the more enjoyable when it's on. So just go and listen to it. Is there anything you'd like to talk about with the whys? So i quickly tell you a little bit about the space, this platform that commissioned. Um, it was, the idea was to try and get British arts organisations to think digitally and to think in a more um, fast-paced and uh, sort of iterative way. It wasn't about sitting and looking at the trees and waiting for divine inspiration to make a B-flat. It was make a thing, get it going, see what happens. Um, it's, I love the idea of art in beta. It's this sort of beta mode of, of creation. And although I'm unlikely to actually ever play in a concert hall to as many people that have, as have listened to The Listening Machine, I don't really think it's about the numbers. People actually care about this, and it's completely bizarre. When it goes offline, if, if a computer breaks or the internet, something, something goes down, we hear about it within minutes. People send us tweets, they email, they blog, about, they, they, there's an instant feedback loop. And I rather unfortunately seem to be getting these alerts on push on my phone, I can't turn it off. And so uh, keep getting these things through. If, you know, if someone's saying, oh, it's not, or why is it sounding like this? Or why is it not happening? Or it's off, ah, it doesn't happen all that often. But when it does, it's really amazing this kind of connection people have to it. And recently found on SoundCloud, uh, people have started to remix it. So people have been doing little extracts and then making remixes of it and sharing them. Um, I can't remember if there's a group. Did we think we talked about making the group? But there is. There are a number of these little remixes, and they're quite cute. And they're they're living with this piece. You know, I hear from people that they put it on and have it on playing in the background, and they sort of say, "Well, I hope you're not offended by that." And I'm like, well, why would I be offended? <laughs> you know, some people have it on for hours on end and just sit and just listen to it happening. And they're staying and they're coming back as well, which is which is really exciting, and it's still playing. And just to close on the space, we're always, as artists, we're always challenged to create relevant work and to create work that means something in its own time, which is fine. But in my humble opinion, this is the first time that the funding model has felt relevant. They've identified key partners, they've identified people to go and make work and just make you get on with it. And it feels like this has taken a long time to, to become relevant to, to us in the way in which we work, um, but I'm sort of relieved that they are starting to look at their role in the creative process. So yeah, we've, we've got a little demo, uh, or Dan has a little demo, which he'll let him talk about. Yeah, so um, we um, thought it would be quite nice um, as something unique to this event to actually uh, demonstrate this sonification framework. Um, behind the listening machine to generate uh, a short piece of music based on all of the tweets from the past 12 hours or so um, that have gone up with the CP Europe hashtag. Um, I imagine that many of you have been uh, tweeting as part of this. So um, what we have here is a little Python script which has uh, a log of all of the um, all of the tweets that have taken place since I think about 5 a.m. Uh, this morning. And so what this program is going to do is it's going to run through each of these tweets. Um, you can see if I can embiggen it. Somewhat embiggened. So um, it's going to go through these tweets at the same rate at which they appeared um, and translate the text of the tweet into a piece of music that it will then uh, play back to you. Well, fingers crossed anyway. This is a bit of an experiment. So um, 
bear with me. So it will just take a sec to load up all of these tweets, and then you'll see it running through. Um, that's the sound of all of you. Thank you. And so there's much more information on our website, uh, listen.org. And we are, of course, on Twitter as Listen Machine. And Peter Gregson here and Idioforms, which is me. Um, so thank you very much for all of your time. Now maybe some questions? Great. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, and maybe you sort of, you sort of touched on this via your closing, um, if, if you guys have thought about, maybe not immediately, but like after this is sort of finished and passed, um, I don't know, you could maybe almost think about it as like taking this on tour. So like, because all, all the tweets that you're using to drive this are from, I assume, people based in Britain, at least sort of nominally. Um, and so the sort of day-night effects are specific to to Britain, to GMT, right? Um, and, and the topics that they're discussing are, are sort of nationally specific to some extent. And I just wonder if there's any thought of localizing it, of taking sort of the song and reproducing it, but with speakers from different countries, uh, sort of almost a global audience maybe, or things, things like this. Sure. Um, so, yeah, we have. In fact, we had a couple of requests from different countries. Someone in Singapore said, would you be able to create a Singapore-based version of the listening machine? Um, and the last time we talked about this, someone joked about there being local dialects of the piece. Um, they intended it to be a joke, because obviously it's music, it doesn't have dialects so much, but I think there's more to that than you would think. Um, yeah. And I think certainly instrumentation-wise and language processing-wise, you could come up with a whole load of different interpretations. Um, though we'd have to look into a lot more about how you would parse non-English languages and maybe sentence structures would be a little bit different. Um, but sure, that's something we'd be really interested in doing. The, the other thing that I, I rather like the idea of is having it um, you know, as, as the time zones shift, so you get different inflections. You know, what we think of as, as music in the West is very different to what they think of in the East and what they think of in the North and in the South. You know, there is a very different kind of inflection um, in a slightly music nerdy point as well. There's, there's a different acceptance of pitch. So what we think of as in tune is not in tune in India, it's not in tune in China. Or in it. So there are all sorts of, kind of really subtle things which I, I mentioned when we were talking about the Singapore thing, when I mentioned that and they sort of went, ha, ha, ha. It's like, yeah, but actually it's the same as having a, you know, a different script, it's a different sort of framework you know, within which you, you acknowledge the, the content that's being discussed. So you know, the recording of this was, was grim. <laughs> it was so much work. And everything was edited, largely edited by hand. So it was really really intense. Um, so mixed languages would be a, you know, making it suitable for any dictionary would be a lot of, of work. But I think it would be a really interesting and, you know, as, as kind of different countries wake up, you get these kind of different flavours coming in and it could be, it could be really, really beautiful. Um, but yeah, we, we have discussed it, but as I say, it's running until the end. We've got a little bit of time, of a safety net until the end of October, but uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and so briefly, the other side of taking it on tour, which is what I thought you were going to ask about, um, is the prospect of doing a live version of the listening machine. And um, 
just between the few of us here, because this is not uh, public knowledge quite yet, um, but we've been having some conversations about the possibility of actually taking this and generating scores that real musicians could play from live. And I think for us that's the really interesting next step, which is the idea that you can generate these scores on a screen that a real musician can play from, um, maybe using live tweets or maybe using some other kind of language thing. So um, watch this space for news on that. Yes, uh, first of all, it's, I think it's a great piece of art and it's a little bit uh, sad that you want to finish it. But uh, have you ever thought about making something like a MIDI file out of it and then to provide it on your website though, uh, so that other people can work with it and um, yes, perhaps remix or remaster it? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. So we were already quite committed to releasing a lot of the stuff around the piece. What I didn't mention is that um, Dope. What I didn't mention is that actually a lot of the sound generating frameworks, the code behind it, are now available um, as open source. So I think it's linked to on our website somewhere, but we've released the code which translates the speech into MIDI, which for sure we'd be really keen for people to start using. Um, send me an email if you can't find a link to that. Um, we're also going to be releasing all of the data which has been logged over the six months. So um, the tweets themselves and then the derived information, so the rates and sentiments and so on. And we're really keen for people to you know, have a look at that and see if there's anything interesting they could do, visualizations and so on. Um, and I guess it would only be quite a small step to then turn that into the MIDI. So um, that's an interesting question, something we'll think about, I think. The, the, uh, there's obviously one slight issue with the um, as you would expect with any kind of publicly funded piece, um, we have a few issues with rights clearance. <laughs> so we've got it waived and the reason we turn it off is we've got the rights cleared until the 31st of October. Um, we're looking at what we can do next. Um, there are obviously ways around it, um, but we want, you know, not ways around it. I mean, there are ways we can move forward, um, but that's, that's why there's that window. Uh, it's purely old industry meets new industry. So. Hi. Have you noticed any patterns, for example, on a Monday morning, is the music particularly sad and Friday evenings particularly happy or monthly, weekly, daily patterns? Do you know, I don't know how many times we've talked about this project in public. I don't think anyone's ever asked that. No. That's actually a really good question. Um, the, on a little side note, I will answer that in a second. Um, all the kind of categorizations are really quite straightforward. I mean, you know, the Olympics, we had quite a lot of sports. Um, it's fairly easy to work it out. Uh, and actually, sometimes I can identify what's being talked about because I'm cool. But um, the one that was really interesting was during the Queen's Golden Jubilee. So the Queen doesn't get sifted on the BBC News website. You know, where the Queen's always on the front page if she does something. So it's not like under parochial news. It's not under sport. It's not under where does the Queen come? I, and I don't know how many of you know about the kind of finer points of, of British um, regal stuff, but the Queen is apolitical. She can't vote. She doesn't have political clout in the UK. Uh, but the, the Jubilee, it was all political music. I, I was listening to it. I was sitting in an airport lounge. Like, why, is the political, like, why is the politics theme being played all day long? And the only reason I can come up with, and maybe you've got a, a stat behind this, but the only reason I could come up with was any time the Queen does something, there's always a comment from the left and a comment from the right. The two major parties always comment. And that is where it gets, I think that's where it gets sifted. I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, so we didn't actually, we did slightly discuss having themes for specific events, but then I think we decided it was against the, the kind of the objective of the piece to have like discrete musical languages. But to your, to your question about Monday mornings, Friday mornings, I don't, I haven't noticed anything, um, I don't listen 24 hours a day, <laughs> that would be, that would be scary, but um, I do, you do absolutely hear uh, transitions, you can hear a kind of general swell, um, and there's, there was a point the day that Etta James died, that I, I tuned in, it was before we launched it, and it was all really quite down and depressing and, and low because um, our, our arts commentators on, on the list are quite active and uh, yeah so that was so I think you, you hear a global thing but I don't think there's personally I don't think there's like a Monday morning blues and a Tuesday morning optimism and Friday evening kind of huzzah 
but you do definitely hear times of day. Okay, there, one more question. There was somebody here. Yeah. Could you please uh, explain a bit more uh, about the mood mechanics? Thank you. The uh, which mechanics, sorry? Mood. About the mood of the music. Oh, yeah, I see. Um, so, um, this sentiment analysis is a really, really difficult problem um, because processing natural language in itself is tricky. You have to understand the sense and the context in which something is being used. Um, even humans can actually only accurately judge the mood of something about 70% of the time, apparently. Um, and our system is a bit below this even. Um, the way that it works is that it looks for terms which are commonly associated with positive or negative emotion. So smileys are a really big one. You put a smiley in your tweet, that's a dead giveaway. It's more or less going to be positive. Um, words like awesome, fabulous, fantastic, amazing. Um, and then there are words like abysmal, terrible, crappy, blah, 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 which are associated with negative. So what you get is a correlation. Um, and it's really a best guess. Like, you can get it wrong. Uh, something could be... Uh, you, you might say this wasn't fantastic, obviously, that's actually a negative sentiment, but picked up as positive. But if you've got enough tweets coming in, you average it out, and you tend to get um, a pretty good representation, more or less. I mean, it's, it's, it's inaccurate, but it's accurate enough. This isn't a sociology project, so in a way we can get away um, with a bit of loose around the edges. And the way in which we did this technically was, again, by using a Python framework called the Natural Language Toolkit, um, and a corpus called Senti WordNet, the sentiment addition to WordNet, which is a whole lookup table that links words to their sentiment. How positive is this word, superb, if it's used as a verb, etc., etc. So that's the overview. And just from a music point of view, um, all the themes, all the keywords, all the content is in uh, major keys, minor keys, and modal keys. So we've got all the music covered. So you can be really happy about politics, really sad about politics, and completely factual about politics. And it'll play the kind of the, the average of, of that uh, and some of the themes I mean the politics theme is quite morose uh, the sports theme is quite upbeat or quite aggressively downbeat so you know when I was writing that bit I was thinking well those those sorts of um, musical aesthetic decisions like people get quite emotionally charged about some things and they don't really get too emotionally charged about others so try to account for that in a, a vaguely human kind of way as well but yeah Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Daniel, for presenting us the listening machine and playing the demo. Um, we will continue in a couple of minutes with the next presentation on our mobile apps, no, interactive albums via mobile apps with Yuli Laptop. <laughs>